uh, after a short break, uh, we may start with the second lecture. Uh, and, and that's the suggestion that I, I mentioned at the beginning. So we will not have those uh, breaks according to schedule and a discussion group, but we'll all mix it up and we'll have discussions and questions during the lectures. So we will prolong a little bit lectures, but uh, hopefully we'll have uh, interactivity and that's, that's the main point. Um, this was this first lecture was was really interesting for me and all the questions that I got uh, they were extremely useful and interesting so uh, we may continue in the same pace. Okay, uh, now we are going to deal with more specific issues within gender economics, and uh, we are going to mention and explain some of the main indicators of gender in general economic indicators and indicators of gender and why they are so relevant and important and then we may basically explain that on a specific example of gender pay gap that's also one uh, interesting issue that we are dealing with today okay so let's start with indicators gender indicators okay similar to, to the previous lecture first of all we have to explain economic indicators just to make things clear and then we may explain uh, gender indicators or GI uh, interpretation and relevance of GI and practical implications on the example of gender pay gap so that's some kind of plan for this lecture but of course I'm flexible and, and I'm ready to answer any question or to address any comment uh, so first of all, economic indicators. In general, that's a piece of economic data, usually of a macroeconomic scale that is used to interpret current or future trends in the economy. So that's indicator and a set of indicators is called index. So we are going to deal with some indexes like gender inequality index, but they are all based on indicators, specific indicators or piece of data. Uh, for example, due to those uh, economic indicators, we may follow GDP, uh, gross domestic product, or unemployment rate, or uh, the consumer price index, etc. So we may follow different economic activities. We may compare them. Uh, uh, we may analyze historical trends, and based on that, we may predict some future trends. So that's why basically indicators are really important, and any economic analysis, even legal analysis, you may find a lot of economic indicators uh, and that's why they are they're really relevant because uh, they enable uh, uh, objective analysis and they're used as a tool within those analyses to quantify uh, uh, results. Uh, for example, within law and economics, we may use, uh, we may analyze new legal rules, uh, how they affect behavior of individuals and firms and allocation of scarce resources. And basically, we provide objective criteria by introducing uh, economic indicators and indexes. Uh, without them, you may argue something is fair, something is not fair. But with those indicators, you may quantify consequences of a certain legal rule or, or a legal institute. So that's why I think uh, uh, those economic indicators and even more specific gender e gender uh, indicators are really important for gender economics and and all other social sciences relying upon gender economics. So everything that we are uh, doing within gender economics, uh, any kind of analysis, basically it's necessary to, to rely upon uh, economic indicators or gender indicators. That's why they are, they are basic and they're really important. Like basic definition of gender economics now, uh, the second basic thing is to, to find a measurement, to establish some kind of measurements of gender inequality, gender equality, uh, and other indexes that we will mention. So it's really important to be able to measure those things and to analyze consequences of certain legal rules or public policies, etc. So that's why indicators are uh, essential. They are really important in economics and also uh, they are really important in gender economics. In just a second. Uh, so basically, as we defined uh, uh, economic indicators, gender indicators, or you will find gender sensitive indicators, 
uh, they serve to measure state of women compared to men in different economic activities. So that's a general definition. So basically, we are trying to measure uh, gender inequality or gender equality. That's that's the main point. And, and the tool for that uh, is gender indicators and gender indexes that we will use and we will present within this lecture. Uh, you may find also different divisions, theoretical divisions, uh, more or less, between uh, different indicators, but the point is the same. So we are using them to, to, to measure uh, state of women compared to men uh, in different economic activities and also other genders. So this is just a general definition, but basically uh, the point is to measure gender inequality or gender equality or uh, gender related issues so that's 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 the main point and without those indicators we cannot uh, uh, quantify anything and we cannot uh, get reliable results or findings within gender economics and uh, why they are so important well i'm sure you are familiar with the term but uh, they are important for gender mainstreaming gender mainstreaming or, or, or improving the quality of legal norms, public policy programs and projects, ensuring a more efficient allocation of scarce resources is impossible without gender indicators. So uh, in, in, one words, uh, uh, in one word, gender indicators are necessary for gender mainstreaming and for basically including those gender issues into economics and other social sciences. And uh, when it comes to gender mainstreaming, it's also important to, to define and to differentiate gender equality and gender parity. Uh, I guess you are aware of those terms, but uh, uh, it's always better to, to, to make it clear. So gender equality is known as sexual equality and is the state of uh, equal ease of access to resources and opportunities regardless of gender, including economic participation and decision making. And gender parity is something different. It's more technical. It's a relative equality in terms of proportions of women and men uh, or different genders, as I mentioned. And it's often calculated as the ratio of female to male values for a given indicator. So just to, to, to be sure that we are on the same page, you should make a difference between gender equality and gender parity when it comes to gender economics and to measure all these things and to be able to, to do gender mainstreaming, basically we need uh, gender indicators. Now we are going to explain uh, some of the main indicators and main indexes. Some of them are still developing, uh, but still they are, they are relevant and, and, and all, I would say, relevant international organizations are using those indexes for their studies and analysis and also individual uh, uh, researchers, uh, uh, they're, they're also using those indexes to, to analyze certain issues related to gender inequality and, and to analyze resulting economic outcomes. So uh, gender indicators uh, enable measuring of gender equality and gender parity and uh, introduction of gender mainstreaming in one word. That's, that's really important. Of course, once again, if you have any questions related to those basic terms, feel free to ask. Uh, if not, now we are going to, to, to deal with specific indicators and indexes and what they are presenting and why they are so relevant and important and how we may use them. For example, if you are dealing with labor law or any other field of law or sociology, uh, during this lecture, we should explain how you may use those indicators and how they are relevant for, for uh, your fields of studies related to, of course, within gender studies. Mm, just to change the slide. So first of all, we're going to mention three main indexes. So that's like three sets of indicators. Uh, uh, first, and I would say the, the, the most famous one or the most useful one is Gender Equality Index, GEI. Uh, uh, it measures the progress of gender equality in the EU. That's a tool that enables policymakers to design more effective gender equality measures by allowing com uh, comparisons between different genders uh, uh, equality domains. And also you may find a link here and all the presentations are available on Moodle. So you may follow these uh, uh, lectures and all these details you may check online and you may see the index because there are many, many details related to those indexes. I'm just gonna mention main uh, characteristics and, and explain why they're relevant. But of course, if you want to check, for example, specific country, 
uh, and, and values for a specific country to compare different countries, regions, you may go to the website and find uh, uh, basically yearly reports uh, and, and find values for, for any specific country. Uh, but the point is, once again, uh, the Gender Equality Index enables us to measure, to quantify gender equality and to compare different countries and to compare different, different legal systems, different legal institutes, and to be able to analyze those legal institutes and improve them uh, 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 by, by taking into account gender inequality and resulting economic inefficiencies or efficiencies. And when it comes to GEI, uh, for example, member states are scored from 1 to 100. A score 100 would mean that the country had reached full equality between women and men. Of course, uh, there is no such country, uh, but you may check for any specific country, for example, if you are interested. Uh, also, we here have, uh, I thought it would be interesting to, to have this uh, screenshot uh, uh, with, uh, with the specific countries within EU. You may see the average. EU average is 68.6. Uh, and you may see the change compared to the previous period and any uh, you may see specific countries especially especially uh, uh, Denmark Sweden uh, Netherlands they are, they are doing uh, relatively better compared to for example Poland uh, Croatia Romania and Western Balkans region uh, also GAI you may follow GAI for Serbia uh, uh, we are first country outside of the EU to launch GEI index back in uh, uh, 2016. And uh, in uh, 2021, the score was 58. And we had improvements over time, but continuous, but, but slow progress in improving uh, G GI, I would say. Uh, so if you compare with other Serbia, with other EU countries, we are somewhere close to Poland and Croatia better than Poland, worse than Croatia, but uh, we are we are uh, below the average, I would say, European average. So the, there are a lot of things that we we should do in the future to to improve our score uh, or our GEI. Uh, and uh, basically, why GEI is, is important because it measures gender equality, as I said and it enables comparisons and also you may see for example for serbia from 2016 uh, till now you may see uh, how we are doing when it comes to gender equality you may see improvements not so great uh, improvements i think we, we could do better but still uh, we are improving certain things and i'm sure that this project law and gender project and, and gender studies in serbia that are uh, developing rapidly i would say it's a it's a huge uh, uh, progress compared to some previous periods. Uh, I think that uh, they may all contribute to to better ranking uh, of Serbia when it comes to gender equality index. But once again, uh, based on this index, uh, we may compare different uh, countries and we may uh, analyze gender equality within particular countries. And also, we may analyze that's a really important relationship between gender equality and economic performances for example gdp unemployment rate and so on and you may find statistically significant correlation between gender equality and those economic performances so it's not only that sweden uh, has a, a better equality index but also they they, they are they, they have better economic performances so you may basically uh, uh, identify a causal link between uh, gender equality and economic performances, uh, the thing that we were, that we mentioned during the, the during the first lecture. Uh, so this is one of the basic indexes that, that, uh, we are using, uh, when it comes to gender economics and other social sciences. And of course, for, for any other details and, and specific countries, you may, uh, you may check the the index. It's European Institute for Gender Equality. They they established this they established this index, and they are publishing every year, uh, uh, basically results for for all European countries, EU countries, and also for for Serbia. So you may follow progress in in every individual country, and also there is a gender parity index and it measures the access to education for men and women or ratio of female to male values at a given stage of education and it was introduced by UNESCO 
Uh, so basically, uh, GPI uh, of less than one suggests that women are more disadvantaged than men in learning opportunities, and GPI greater than one suggests that other way around, that uh, men are more disadvantaged, which is rare, I would say. Uh, but once again, this index is, is really important and relevant because it enables us to compare different societies and compare uh, uh, access of men and women or ratio of female and male uh, uh, within education, which is really important later on for all other economic activities. Uh, and basically, uh, this index is, is in particular used by international organizations for measuring the progress of developing countries and attempts to eliminate gender disparities in primary and secondary education. So this is a more specific index compared to the previous one. It's focused on education, but also education is always an important act, aspect of gender, of gender equality. So that's why you see that we may establish different indexes based on different indicators to analyze different aspects of gender equality and different fields of, 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 of uh, economics and other social sciences. And it's really important to, to emphasize that those indexes are, are not something that is given to us. So there is also huge room for improvement. We could create new indexes. We could, we could analyze new indicators, but it's really important uh, because those indexes are standardized and you may follow the progress over the years and they are the same for, for every particular country. So that's why they are so useful when conducting some kind of, of analysis when analyzing gender inequality and resulting economic uh, outcomes. And also we have results for Serbia and not so surprisingly we are doing very well based on the World Bank data. Uh, we, we are basically among the, the, the best countries when it comes to gender parity index. And I think uh, traditionally in Serbia, we have a, a, a significant share of uh, women uh, or female uh, uh, within uh, educational system, primary and secondary education, even higher education. I think that we are doing quite well in that field. But unfortunately, in some other fields, we are not so good. But for example, in this field, in within education, you may see that index, basically GPI captures that, captures that we are good in that field. Still, we, we can make some improvements, of course. But we are, I, in my opinion, we are doing relatively better compared to some other fields or aspects of gender equality. And this is a, a, a could be evidence of, of this indicator capturing a state of play within particular countries. So in Serbia, we are, we are doing quite well when it comes to primary and secondary education, but unfortunately, there are many, many other aspects related to gender inequality. And you may see the rest of the world here, gender parity index. Unfortunately, for some countries, we do not have uh, reliable data, but unfortunately, majority of Africa, India, Central Asia, uh, they, they, they really have a, a huge uh, gender disparity, I would say, or huge proportion or share of men uh, within education compared to women, which is really, really a bad sign. And I think that's why, among the other things, they have uh, poor economic performances because huge potential uh, potential related to, to women, women labor force, their, their potential, innovative potential, entrepreneurship potential, everything is wasted if you do not include uh, women into educational system and if you do not educate them. So that's why this is one of the basic indexes. And even though it's in, in Serbia and this region, we are taking that, in my opinion, we are taking that for granted because we had some kind of tradition and pre-established system of education, which was quite good when it comes to education of women. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the case with, with the other parts of the world. And we have uh, uh, many parts of the world where women uh, cannot uh, uh, access, do not have access to education. And at the beginning, basically, you're, you're wasting uh, potential of women labor force, women in innovativity, uh, their entrepreneurship and all other basically scarce resources, you are wasting them if you are excluding women from educational system. That's, that's why this index is usually used for, for developing countries uh, to measure their progress, because within developed countries, it goes without saying that you have to have uh, gender parity uh, within education.
So I, I think the question, because I do not know this, I'm just asking to be informed and to know more. So illiteracy and those female and all, all uh, people who have not been in, involved into the educational system, for example, in our society, we have a high level of illiteracy. So it means, uh, uh, especially in villages, and especially among female peasants. So does this index hide or neglect this issue uh, I'm mentioning now? Uh, yes, I think it covers, because this index is based on, on basically uh, many uh, individual indicators, including access to literature, including access to uh -huh. including literacy and, and basically that's I wanted to say access to primary education and secondary education so that's that's I, I think it's included within this index by following particular uh, individual indicators but once again uh, all these indexes are made of uh, many individual indicators you will see the third one I'm going to analyze some of the specific indicators but it would be honestly uh, too demanding to go into details with every single index and every single indicator because uh, there are many, many of them, uh, many indexes, uh, many indicators creating one index. So that's why index are so valuable because they observe many things at the same time. And based on all those uh, indicators, you may use just one index instead of all those indicators and compare different countries and compare access to education. So. Uh, yes, I, I think they, they include that, that issue as well, uh, but once again, uh, that's only one aspect of, of access to, to education, but it certainly we may follow, uh, by following this index, we may follow the state of play in, in that regard. So, yes, it, it, is, it is relevant and it covers that, that question. Um, but also, once again, it is the most relevant for, for developing countries because somehow all developed countries, and once again, that's not, uh, that's, that's not uh, uh, by chance, something that happens by, by chance, but all developed countries, they have uh, a gender parity within education, so which, which proves that the gender parity in education is necessary or a precondition for economic development. Of course, but just once again, so if we have a high level rate of illiteracy among certain social female certain groups of female population on one hand and on another we have these comparatively speaking rather good rates for uh, female uh, persons who have been involved into the educational system so there is the, the discrepancy, there is the problem, there is the issue, the huge, the very serious issue from the point of gender perspective, gender equality perspective. If you have so mm -hmm. huge percentages of illiterate women, then you have the problem, in spite of the fact that you have good parity uh, in regards of those male and female, comparatively speaking, who have been involved into the educational system from the primary up to the higher education. Uh, thank you once again for, for a clarification. Now now I can see better your point and I think you're right. But honestly, I'm, I'm not familiar with the numbers, with the illiteracy in, in Serbia and other countries. Uh, but what comes to my mind is that we have illiteracy in some small communities. Uh, so basically, it could be the case that because majority of population in Serbia is in is within uh, capital or other towns in Serbia or other well developed communities, not so remote as small villages. So basically, I, I would say that statistically, maybe illiteracy is not statistically mm -hmm. such a good problem, and that's why we are scoring a, a, a high result. Uh, when it comes to GPI. So maybe that, that could be answered. But of course, when it comes to those specific, uh, I would say, villages or, or uh, surroundings, when we have huge illiteracy, that's, that's also a relevant problem that we should address. But uh, maybe that's not captured by, by this index when it comes to, to large scale and uh, percentages. 
we have a good parity. So maybe that uh, share of women is not statistically significant for, for this index, yes. Uh, I see that we have some questions online, but could you could you raise your hand and ask question? Because I saw <laughs> a lot of text here. It would take some time to read it all. So please raise hand and, and ask question. You're all welcome, more than welcome. I'm not sure where is exactly the question. This book. Uh, this is more like a recommendation uh, for a book. It could be interesting to read it. Um, do we need to change the whole system of production and use of resources so we can eliminate inequality? Uh, okay, this is a really good question. Uh, abstract one, but still really good and, and, and well-defined. So do we need to change the whole system of production and use of resources so we can eliminate inequality. The, the first question is, should we eliminate inequality? We were talking about within the first lecture. So in my opinion, we should not completely eliminate inequality, especially, of course, when we're talking about economic inequality, not gender inequality. Uh, we should not eliminate. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, do we need to change the whole system of production to do that, even if we need to eliminate? In my opinion, uh, we do not need to change the whole system, but and it's it's not a point in some kind of revolution or or uh, making things uh, from the beginning all over again. But I think that in, in in slight improvements, the solution is is in small steps and small improvements, and that's the only way how we may improve uh, our system. Once again, I think that we have a, a relatively good system, well developed system when it comes to law and economics as well. Uh, so that's why I said we do not negate uh, classical economics and all the other findings within social sciences. We should rely upon them. And that's the other reason why we should keep this system but make it better uh, by making small improvements. For example, amending legal institutes, specific legal institutes, not necessarily a whole branch of law or something like that. So in my opinion, that's more realistic approach to use all those findings uh, within uh, gender studies. And we have a lot of findings recently, a lot of re relevant findings that we may use in practice. Uh, so to use those findings to, to amend or improve uh, specific legal institutes and uh, in that way to uh, in improve economic performances. So really good question. And once again, I think that the solution is in, in small improvements, not necessarily in abandoning the, the, the current system and, and creating a new one. Okay, this, this was an example of a good question online question within a chat. Uh, yes, and the answer was we need. <laughs> okay, we need to eliminate inequality. Okay, yeah, we have different opinions. That's always good. But uh, what is also what would be good when you have some answer uh, we don't have right and wrong answers, but the point is to, to provide an argument behind that answer. So if you have answer, yes, we need to change the whole system, uh, the good thing and the best thing to do would be to, to basically uh, uh, provide some comments or, or arguments why you, you think so. And then we may have a discussion. Uh, so once again, we don't have right and wrong answers, but it's always good to have discussion. So it would be really good if... Uh, uh, Ljubisov Medovic could provide some, some additional uh, insights and, and arguments why he thinks so. Of course, it's, it's not mandatory, but it's interesting. And I think that we could have an interesting debate on, on this issue. Uh, and I think for now, that's all that we have in, in chat. Okay, we may go back to, to, to gender indexes and gender parity index. Just a second. Okay, then once again, gender parity index is, is uh, even though when we are talking about gender parity is we are talking in general about proportion of men relevant to proportion of women in certain fields, this gender parity index is, is specifically related to education. That's important to emphasize. But once again, education is one of the most important aspects of gender inequality and also it affects 
economic performances and once again uh, countries that are uh, basically making good score and and that high that are highly ranked uh, they basically they are having better economic performances and you may see direct link between uh, gender parity in education and and economic performances because without education and par uh, and parity in education we cannot use huge potential of women, women labor, women ideas, women entrepreneurship, and so on. So that's why it's really important to include women within society, within educational systems, to 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 utilize all those huge potentials that unfortunately we are not using enough, in my opinion. We're going to talk about that also later on. So this was gender parity index, and also we have gender inequality index, developed by United Nations. Uh, United Nations Development Program. Also, you may find a link and follow at the same time while, while we are talking about this index. Uh, and it's used to, basically, it's a composite metric of gender inequality using three dimensions, reproductive health, uh, empowerment, and the labor market. So now you may see that we have different indexes for basically different aspects, different dimensions, different aspects of economic, different economic activities. Uh, as you wish. So uh, basically, this is also important because it covers three really important dimensions, reproductive health, empowerment and labor market, and low GII values indicates low inequality between women and men. So when it comes to this index, it's better to have lower score. So then we have lower, less inequality within society. And you'll see this is really relevant index. Uh, you may find online, I just uh, took a result for Serbia and some other countries, uh, but basically you may find all countries recognized by the United Nations and average for, for example, Asia, Europe, and so on. So once again, GII reflects gender-based disadvantage in, in these three dimensions and the loss of potential human development due to inequality between uh, female and male. Uh, so once again, uh, inequality produces losses in terms of economics or equality creates economic wealth that's that's a re really important link uh, to, to emphasize within gender economics because we may analyze specific issues but it's all about that inequality and economic outcomes or economic performances and now we empirically proven that this link exists and, and we are trying basically to, to, to utilize uh, potentials that we have, to use potentials that we have. And Serbia uh, was reported, uh, basically you may see the score for, for uh, the previous year, uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.13, which is, which is relatively good score. Uh, just a second. Here we are. Yeah, just relatively good score, for example, uh, Germany is doing better in France, but for example, neighboring countries like Croatia and 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 uh, um, Slovenia, they are they are having a, a higher inequality index. So uh, we are quite uh, well ranked when it comes to this index. But once again, we have different rankings because all these indexes they are taking different. Uh, indicators into account and that's important when we are talking about indicators and indexes to understand that if you are dealing within your scientific field with those indicators and you want to bring some objectivity to your analysis it's important to to know that when you are dealing with certain index you have to see what are the indicators behind or what are indicators composing that that index and here you may see for example some of the main indicators making creating this inequality index for example uh, sh uh, share of seats in parliament female and male so we are not doing quite quite good <laughs> with that respect but i guess that could be changed in 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 the future relatively easily but that that's really important indicator because if women are not represented uh, within those uh, the most important bodies, and if they are not uh, included into policy making and law making processes, then basically that affects their position in a society in general. So that's why I guess they, they took this indicator as a basis for gender inequality index. Also, uh, you may see a, a population with at least some secondary education. That's also interesting. And once again, you may see, you may compare the previous index with this one, and we are doing quite 
quite good because women in Serbia have relatively good access to, to education. But I think uh, the, the indicator that bothers us the most in Serbia, I would say, is labor force participation rate. And we have uh, overall, when we consider labor force in Serbia, 62.3% uh, are men and only 46% women. So that's that's uh, really uh, that indicates that women are disadvantaged. We don't definitely we do not have gender parity, uh, but also it indicates that we do not have gender equality as well, and. It also indicates that we are missing some opportunities and that we are not using huge potential that we have and that we should definitely do something about that. And also, uh, for example, in general, you may follow by uh, the, the state of play, you may analyze by using this index, but also if we go into more specific issues like gender pay gap, uh, we also may analyze what are the consequences of labor law, uh, labor force participation and all those things that we have currently in Serbia. So I'm not going to deal with education because, as I said, we are doing relatively well or the seats in, in parliament, but it's interesting to, to analyze further labor force participation and the related issue is uh, gender pay gap. Uh, gender pay gap is, is we already had some discussions uh, on this topic. Uh, gender pay gap, to put it simple, is that women on average earn less than men. Okay, even though we have 60% of men within the labor force and 40% of women, when we take average salary, women earn less, significantly less than men. Okay, even though if we had gender parity, for example, if we assume that we have 50% of men, 50% of women participating in the labor force, women have significantly lower average salary. Okay, that's a gender pay gap. Okay, they are paid less than men. So that's that's the gender pay gap. And it's not uh, a characteristic only for, for Serbia, but also many other countries uh, in, in the world. And only recently countries started to follow the gender pay gap and to analyze why women are paid less uh, than men. And for example, it's su surprisingly, it, it was for me at the beginning that within the European Union, you have 14.1% gender pay gap, meaning that women on average earn 40% less than men. Okay, that, that's a significant that's a significant difference. Also in the United States, in it's even worse than that, 18% women earn less than men. In Asia and Africa, it's even worse than that. It's it goes up to 20 to 25 percent. So, for example, in Serbia, if men on average would earn one uh, one thousand dinners or one hundred thousand dinners, one hundred, it would be more realistic thousand dinners. Uh, uh, women would earn on average uh, eighty five thousand dinners. So it's it's a huge huge difference. Okay, or even less than that, seventy five. If if we are talking about Africa, so. Yes, we have a question here, so we'll make a short uh, detour. It, it was the question of some other colleagues also before. Still, we cannot understand how does it come that uh, for the same position, for the same job, male and female, uh, there is a gap or difference in their salary? How, how does it come? I mean, imagine, for example, a nurse with the same degree of education, uh, working in the same hospital, in the same position, why should be difference, but I'm sure there is no such thing in Iran, at least. It's something interesting that I'm hearing. Yeah, now, now we're going we're gonna to explain in detail uh, what is behind the gender pay gap, why do we have a gender pay gap, and how it's possible. For me, it's also hard to, 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 to comprehend that, to understand that, how it's possible, but it happens. And statistically, that's why indicators are so important. Statistically, we may compare different countries and we may prove that's the case. That it's hard to believe, but that's the case. Within European Union, women earn 14% less than men. Uh, within the States, 18% Asia and Africa, it's even worse than that. So, uh, I'm gonna, should we answer what are the reasons? What could be the reasons? Or we have, we have the second question before that. Go ahead. 
I'm not sure if it's before this or not, but uh, I'm not sure what we're talking about here. Is it a gender pay gap in the sense that all jobs which men and women do, when we take the average, the average pays less, so that could be due to women paying, doing less paying jobs, or are we talking about the same job being paid differently for men and women? Because I'm a little confused. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 part of the answer, and it's really important because we have a raw or unjusted uh, gender pay gap. Okay, so we do not take into account in that case we do not take into account different positions, different jobs, and then we are talking about raw or unjusted uh, gender pay gap. Then we just say, okay, we have. Uh, this and that men employed, this and that women employed. On average, men earn this much, women earn that much, and the gap is gender pay gap. Okay, that's also an indicator of gender inequality in the first place. No matter how, uh, of course, we may have different divisions between different professions and so on. Uh, but if we take into account all those things that you mentioned, uh, level of education, uh, productivity level, and so on, then we are talking about adjusted pay gap. Okay, adjusted gender pay gap. So uh, it's a really good question. We, we should uh, basically clarify those things be before uh, dealing with, with the reasons or causes of gender pay gap. So we have two types of gender pay gap in literature. The first one is adjusted or raw gender pay gap. When we just take into account average salary of men and women, and the difference is gender pay gap. And in those cases, we are talking about adjusted gender pay gap. I agree, uh, there are many, many relevant issues like professions, level of education, and so on. But still, the easiest way to, to observe all those things is to have adjusted gender pay gap. And, and this index basically covers a gender pay gap within European Union, United States, and so on. We have adjusted gender pay gap. But also, in some studies, we have adjusted gender pay gaps, adjusted for a level of education, uh, human capital, productivity, and so on. And surprisingly, also, when it comes to adjusted gender pay gap, we have huge differences. So it is possible, unfortunately, to have men and women working at the same position, occupying same position, with the same experience, with the same level of education, having different wages. So that would be adjust, oh, adjusted uh, gender pay gap. So there are different uh, terms that we are dealing with, and that's why the question was really, really uh, good and important. But still, even if we take into account all those differences, like level of education, uh, human capital, and so on, or if you are talking about adjusted gender pay gap, still in many countries we have differences between salaries of men and women. So, and that's that. Now we are coming to the to the causes or reasons behind the gender pay gap. But before that, do we have another question or? No, just to give the example for, for this, what Sophie asked and what you explained as the second mm -hmm. form or aspect or, or dimension of this gender pay gap, when we have equal positions, equal profession, equal value of work, but still, maybe this can help, this exa example maybe can help. For example, we did um desk analysis here at the faculty of law a few years ago and then compared uh, got from the financial department uh, results for uh, let's say for full professors for a certain, i can't remember now for how for how long period of time but let's say 10 10 years uh, from 2009 to 2019, I can't remember exactly, but still. And there we found the difference of 14 or 15 percent. So they really have, by law, determined equal salaries. But then when you add to that salary, uh, the factor that full professors, male full professors, proportionally speaking, they have been in bigger numbers and for a longer time, because previously, in previous decades, we had, proportionally speaking, more, more male ac academic staff, and they, and then had also, at the end of the day, more of them becoming full professors. That maybe I did not explain this the best, but Nicola will help. But then, 
additional to that uh, patriarchal matrix and more of them being in that position for the longer period of time contributes to that that they get more more additional positions in different commissions in different additional jobs uh, projects dedicate uh, given to them instead of to the female ones so just as the example You mean beside their main position, they have more opportunities on to... the basis of that position, and also within the institution, they they get more opportunities to become the members of different commissions, uh, different projects, which also contribute to to the additional amount of their average salary. Per month, per year, it doesn't matter at the moment. Did I explain this? Yeah, yeah, we're going to continue with this discussion, but we have another question. Now go ahead. Well, yes, I have a question concerning this because you say that male professors got more opportunities for some extra jobs. So in that case, I see that as a gap in opportunities, but not a gender pay gap because they are not doing the same job. They also have some other uh, obligations they have to fulfill in order to get that extra money. So, so it's not formally that you are doing the absolutely same actions, but receiving different amounts, but only that they have some not a legal advantage, but cultural advantage or whatever to get more opportunities. But So that's a very good reasoning, but still we are speaking about full professors of the same institution at the same time in the same period. However, so that, that is one example, but another one uh, maybe can help or add to, to this discussion and Nicola can say what is the most proper understanding of this. At the same time, uh, again, high academic positions, lecturers being associate professors or assistant professors, among them, this gap, this gap which I mentioned, has been significantly diminished in a way that among assistant professors, so docents, those who uh, take, uh, among male and female, who, who take part in, le in giving lectures, different commissions, and in the meantime, uh, the, the proportion of female uh, academic staff among associate professors uh, went up. So there we do not have this discrepancy, which I mentioned for full professors at the same time in the same institution. Uh, I'll be short and then we can, <laughs> I know this went on. Uh, so I'm, uh, I agree here that this is some form of inequality and I'm glad that it's getting better with uh, further generations. I'm just theoretically speaking that this is not what I meant when I know that other colleagues also asked how can a man and a woman do the exact same job and get a different amount of pay. So this is not the answer to that question. But of course, the question of inequality in the context of the same institution, the same position and different opportunities is very apparent in your example and I completely agree with it that it's not fair and it's not, not what should be there. So when you say now that assistant professors have a more um, equalized position, that's good progress. So I hope that's going to transfer to the higher positions as well as time progresses. So. Okay, thank you once again, and let me try to contribute a little bit to, to this interesting uh, discussion. Uh, just to explain, okay, we are on the same page when it comes to gender pay gap. Okay, the difference between average salaries of men and women. Okay, we uh, basically uh, differentiate uh, unjusted gender pay gap, which is in total average wage of men and women and adjusted when we take into account level of education and all other things okay then we are talking about now what is the reason behind the gender pay gap we are talking about we may talk about adjusted gender pay gap when they are doing the same job the same qualification same productivity and have different salaries okay i agree with you that 
in in a narrow sense uh, this case, uh, in this case of full professor or assistant professors, we are not talking about the gender pay gap, but it's not uh, that that clear distinction uh, between gender pay gap and discrimination. Uh, you'll see now when we are talking about, of course, this is a presentation for different countries and gender pay gap, but now we are talking about reasons. Uh, just a second, another direction. We're talking about reasons behind gender pay gap, and I think I will be able to, to basically explain uh, and answer your question. So basically, we have uh, legal and economic aspects. Okay, why we have systematic differences between average wages of women and men, or adjusted gender pay gap. In terms of law, that's really important. Uh, equal pay for men and women for work of equal value, that's a principle that's been established by Treaty of Rome in 1957 by Article 119 and confirmed by the ECJ. So that's beyond question. We have a principle of equal pay for work of equal value. Okay, then that's protected by the law. But uh, in economics, uh, and that's protected within national legislation, among other countries, we also protect that principle, equal pay for work of equal value. And Professor Vyadinovich said, by law, we all have the same wages. Okay, And that's, that's really important to protect that principle, because uh, unfortunately, there are some countries that even do not respect this principle. And by law, they introduce uh, different wages for men and women for same occupation. That's the most dangerous scenario, and I think that's that's uh, the biggest problem in those countries that do not have this principle of equal pay for work of equal value. Uh, but also in terms of economics, uh, it's important uh, to to distinguish what are the reasons behind different salaries. If the reason is productivity, if something is more, if somebody is more productive. For example, if Professor Vyadinovich besides a regular job, has two additional projects, a huge amount of, huge load of work and, and a huge uh, things that she's doing besides regular job, it's completely normal to have higher income, higher salary. Uh, so that's, for me, that's a legitimate base for discrimination, for differences between salaries. But uh, the, 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 the important thing is, uh, that the reason behind gender pay gap may be discrimination. And that's something that violates this principle and that's something that should be that we should deal with. Uh, for example, in this case, somebody could be discriminated just because she's a woman and uh, she'll get less opportunities for those additional jobs and so on. So, And that will be reflected in a salary. So in that way, if a discrimination is a basis for different salaries, discrimination against women just because they are women, then obviously that's a violation of this legal uh, principle and that's, that, that's the gender pay gap that we should eliminate uh, to increase productivity and to, to maximize social welfare in terms of economics. But if uh, behind the gender pay gap is different productivity, if somebody is working more and, and getting a uh, higher salary, then that's completely fine. We are not violating because uh, we don't have uh, the same uh, work. So the value of work is, not also, is, is also different. And then the gender pay gap is justified and acceptable. So that's, that's uh, really... Uh, catchy thing and it's it's important to explain because many people advocating gender equality they are saying we should completely eliminate gender pay gap we should all have the same salaries it's not like that in some cases women earn more because they they are more productive they have additional projects there they have additional working hours and then it's 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 more uh, in terms of economics. They should have uh, higher salaries because in that way, in that way, we are protecting productivity, incentives for productivity. Okay, but to go back to this example that Professor mentioned, I'm afraid that in this case, uh, uh, partially the gender pay gap could be caused by discrimination against women, and that's the thing that we should. Partially, yes. And that's the thing that we should prevent uh, uh, and, and fight against. Because if somebody is discriminated and is getting less opportunities just because of gender, then that's a problem. And then we are reducing basically productivity, incentives for productivity, and we'll have uh, uh, basically uh, 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 
economic outcomes that are not desirable. So it's really a tricky question when talking about gender pay gap. Uh, we should basically focus on, on uh, reasons behind gender pay gap. And if the reason behind the gender pay gap is discrimination against women, any kind of discrimination, if they are doing the same job and receiving different salaries, then we should eliminate that gender pay gap. And we should do that by amending legal institutes, by amending public policies and so on. But, but in this case, uh, the legacy, the patriarchal legacy has been playing the role and uh, indirect discrimination coming from that, that more male persons entered 30, 40 years ago the academia and the faculty of law and more of them, proportionally speaking, got the position of the full professor, comparatively speaking, etc., etc., I, I totally agree, and that's why I said partially, uh, because in, in, in essence, uh, uh, it, it's really hard now to establish boundaries, once again, because whether that's based on productivity or based on that heritage that we have, but unfortunately, it's it's based partially to a large extent to that heritage that we have. It's not rare even today, to be honest, to hear in Serbia, no. women are not for academia. I, I, I really... I don't know how to react on that, honestly. It's, it's, it goes beyond my imagination that somebody in the 21st century may say something like that. But honestly, and we all know that that's happening, that somebody may say women are not for academia. Even if they are within academia, then they are trying to diminish their accomplishments. They are trying to, they are having less opportunities. In other words, they are being discriminated against. And that's the thing that we should prevent. And if the pay gap is based on discrimination, then it's not only about economics, but also we have violation of this principle, equal pay for work of equal value. And that's why it's important to deal with causes of inequalities, gender pay gap. When it comes to gender economics, we always emphasize that relationship between inequality and economic outcomes, but also it's important to analyze reasons behind inequalities and causes. And now you may see uh, we have to differentiate the reasons behind gender pay gap. If the reason is productivity, that's fine. Somebody may work more, be more productive and have higher salary. But if the reason is, uh, is, is, uh, uh, is, uh, if the reason is discrimination, that's, that's something that should be forbidden and we, we all should deal with that issue. And if we close the gender pay gap based on discrimination, we will certainly improve economic outcomes. And once again, just to, to, to uh, distinguish those terms and to clarify. So we have gender pay gap in general. When you find in literature on in general gender pay gap, they usually mean unjusted gender pay gap. They mean average salary of men compared to average salary of women is, is higher. Okay, that's the gender pay gap. For example, men in Serbia on average earn 100,000 and women earn uh, 80, 100,000. 20,000 difference is unjust gender pay gap for all the occupations and, and, and all the people employed in Serbia. That's unjusted pay gap. And adjusted pay gap, it would be if we would analyze their level of education, their productivity, their human capital, and so on, and include that in the calculation, that's why usually you find unjusted, because it's easier to find the data for employed men, employed women, and their average salary, and to compare that. But it's, it's a way harder to provide adjusted, you will have to take into account many different indicators like level of education, uh, productivity, which is hard to measure. But even in those cases in literature, when we have calculated adjusted uh, pay gap, when it take into account all those differences, we have different wages for men and women, which means that that uh, we have discrimination against women, and that's that's the thing that we should deal with. And uh, if we want to improve our economic performances and to, to, to have better economic outcomes. So that's why now you may see how those indexes are important when analyzing specific issue issues. Gender pay gap is a specific issue when it comes to earnings of men and women in any country. And you see, even if it's hard to imagine that we have gender pay gap, adjusted gender pay gap, we have it not only in Serbia, but also in, in European Union, in United States, in all other countries. And you have you may find different study. For example, this European uh, Gender Institute that we mentioned, uh, they made a really good study and they calculated that if we would reduce the gender pay gap based on discrimination, we could increase GDP per capita by 2 to 
which is a significant amount of, of wealth. So it's, it's, it's not just a question about, about women and their earnings, but it's a question about our society and, 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 and we would all live better if we deal with those issues uh, uh, appropriately and if we solve uh, the, these problems. Uh, just to check the chat and, and maybe find some additional questions. Um, I have to say that I did not understand the explanation, but I don't know, uh, yeah, what was the question? You may raise your hand and, and ask question. That would be like the best case scenario and explain what do you think. Otherwise, it's, it's really hard to guess uh, uh, what explanation you are referring to. Uh, but, but I think that we made it clear uh, at least for, for those people involved uh, uh, and, and following the discussion, what is the gender pay gap, adjusted and unjusted gender pay gap, and what are the reasons behind the gender pay gap? In essence, if the reason is productivity or different level of education, that's fine because we don't want to we don't want harm incentives for productivity that's fine uh, but if the the reason for behind the gender pay gap is discrimination against women if you are earning less just because you're women then that, that's that's a real problem that we have to deal with in terms of economics in terms of law in terms of sociology and all other gender studies so that's and and now you may see how it's helpful uh, to help to have those indicators and indexes because without them we may debate, for example, professors or small amounts, small group of people, what salaries they have and so on. But at the end of the day, we have to calculate all that and to, to have some kind of measurement. And therefore, we need those indicators and indexes to be able to bring objectivity to this debate. And then we basically may differentiate those reasons behind gender pay gap. And we also may suggest more efficient public policies and more efficient uh, amendments to current legal solutions to, to, to handle this problem. So, and now you see how we are going from, from some abstract definition to more specific and specific issues uh, related to gender economics. And when talking about all those issues, you, you may see that uh, interconnectedness or, or those relationships between gender economics and all other social sciences, especially law and, and sociology, uh, because we are really dealing with the same problem and it's impossible to, to, to react or to deal with these problems independently. So that's why all gender studies, in my opinion, are, are equally important. And especially gender economics may, may bring those tools and objectivity and may help other social scientists to, to deal in a more efficient way with those problems that we are identifying. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess that this question is the same which Farhas uh, put also. So, and also that question was raised at the beginning of the spring school so not being able to understand how is that possible so that's the question that for the same job uh, of equal value sometimes probably happens that uh, the salary of female sal of females is lower that I think I suppose that that is the puzzle and the question. Yes. I, I suppose so, I guess so. Yeah. Yes, and j just to put it simple, in my opinion, uh, if I would have to, to answer in, in, in one sentence, the reason is discrimination. But we have different ways of discriminating uh, women and discrimination against women. So we could go more into details when it comes to this issue, but uh, uh, in my opinion, it is possible due to discrimination and that's that's possible probably maternity leave or pa parental leave or most often uh, related to female to mothers and maybe the solutions uh, in that regard of so maternity leave do contri could contribute to this disparity or how do you call that discrimination uh, this is also a really, really good question. And now we are talking about di discrimination, whether something is discrimination or not. For example, maternity leave. And, and I fully, fully agree with you. <laughs> Just to add, sometimes uh, the payment in some societies, in some policies, maternity leave uh, is regulated with uh, 
uh, maternity leave being equal to the salary. But very often it is not. So may, maybe there also is one of the sources of the problem and discrimination, how you said. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the quality and character of maternity leave, the amount of money uh, related to maternity leave. De definitely, definitely, and th those are all all uh, different and really important issues. For example, maternity leave in Serbia, uh, especially uh, women entrepreneurs, uh, they are they are not paid almost at all during maternity leave, and they have to use maternity leave. And that's, in my opinion, that's a real disaster and thing that we have to change uh, in the near future. Uh, uh, and but I also I, I also think all those things like using maternity leave uh, uh, only by, by only women. by by women is a discrimination. Right now I have to say, <laughs> on my own example, I'm taking care of my uh, 11 months old baby because my 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 wife is working, and we thought that would be reasonable. And honestly, I couldn't even imagine <laughs> how it's like to take care about uh, a little baby girl, and that's like a full time job, honestly. And I couldn't even imagine that before I started to do that, actually, and to spend a whole day with, with my baby. And I think that everybody should do that. Uh, and also, I think that it's underestimated uh, that uh, a contribution of women to the economy, because we wouldn't have economy in the first place without children, without, without new generations. And unfortunately, we wouldn't have new generations without these women, because most of the time they are using paternity leave, they are taking care of children or family. It goes without saying that women ha they have to do that uh, somehow it's it's a part of tradition it's it's part of culture uh, also we may we may debate about that but in my opinion all of those things are are, are uh, types of discrimination against women and if all of those things affect salary and they are definitely affecting salary then uh, that means that that we should change that and as i mentioned all those institutes in the first place european gender institute they basically discovered that by reducing the gender pay gap uh, and, and, and dealing with gender equality issues, basically we may improve economic performances and we may have a higher GDP per capita up to 2 to 3%, which is really, really significant uh, because we are talking only about one specific uh, gender-related issue and that's gender pay gap. But once again, in my opinion, there are different reasons behind gender pay gap. If the productivity is the reason, that's fine. That's fine. Somebody is more productive and is having higher salary, no matter whether that's men or women. Uh, but but if the discrimination against women, because only women have they have to use maternity leave, only women have to take care about family, children, and so on. Then that's that's discrimination, and we should not uh, uh, tolerate that, in my opinion. And uh, in that way, we are we are we, we are having suboptimal allocation of resources of female labor. Uh, that, that that's the point, and we have some suboptimal economic outcomes. So, in terms of gender economics, we should definitely uh, prevent discrimination against women, reduce gender pay gap based on discrimination, and all of that to have better economic performances, to have a higher living standard and, and better society that we are living in. Of course, there are many many aspects that you will cover during other courses, like. Uh, human rights and, and other things, political rights, equality, and so on. But in terms of economics, uh, we may prove that if, if the reason for gender pay gap is discrimination, that basically will create suboptimal allocation of resources and we are wasting potential that, that we may use. Okay, now I guess it's, it's clear what is gender pay gap unjusted and adjusted uh, gender pay gap and the reasons behind the gender pay gap and and still once again you may find different countries and you may have uh, by following those indexes that we mentioned and indicators you may see for every uh, per single country uh, how they are doing uh, uh, with, with gender pay gap and, and discrimination so once again yeah this is conclusion but we all together basically concluded in the same way that uh, gender pay gap uh, occurs due to different uh, uh, reasons and I divided type 1 and type 2 and type 1 basically is gender pay gap based on productivity so if somebody has more projects working more then it's uh, completely fine and, and should have 
higher salary. But if you have gender pay gap type two, if it's based on discrimination only because uh, you're women, then that's that's something that we should uh, basically prevent, and and we should use all available tools and resources to to close that gender pay gap based on discrimination and to improve our economic performances. And as I said, that's already empirically proven. So, but still there is a, a lot of things that we should do in Serbia and other countries to, to basically uh, eliminate that gender pay gap based on discrimination. Uh, okay, uh, now we are approaching the end of the second lecture, but just uh, to basically to uh, uh, have some concluding remarks and then also we'll have questions and comments at the end and discussion. So just to conclude, when it comes to gender indicators, as I said, they're they are really important and you saw they're relevant. So they represent a specific subset of economic indicators and they enable measurement and empirical analysis of the state of women compared to men in different economic activities. And that's really important for, for further analysis, not only for gender economics, but also for other gender studies. Gender indicators basically provide a solid analytical platform and they enable gender mainstreaming, not only once again in economics, but also in all other, all other social sciences. That's why gender indicators and indexes are so important. And also, as I mentioned, they may bring objectivity and accuracy to law, sociology and other social sciences dealing with gender inequality. That's why it's really important to understand gender indicators, indexes, and to develop them further. Because as you saw, uh, they're not something that is given, but we are still developing those indexes and we are still measuring uh, gender inequality and comparing uh, different countries. But still without indicators, without uh, indexes, uh, we wouldn't be able to do so. And once again, before uh, 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 we start with the questions, uh, also uh, one uh, quotation for the end <laughs> so this is a, a, a this is a famous uh, uh, public figure fighting for for uh, gender equality and she said we are still not paid equally and if you believe that's a myth do the math so that's why we are using indicators and we are calculating and we are differentiating uh, unjusted and adjusted gender pay gap. And unequal pay hurts women, it hurts their families, and it hurts us all. And once again, as I mentioned, that's, that's the main focus within gender economics, how those gender inequalities affect uh, economic outcomes. And when it comes to gender pay gap, as she said, really that hurts us all. And that's important to emphasize. It's not only about women. It's not only about discrimination against women, but it's about whole society and economy and, and a society that we are living in. So uh, to understand that better, once again, indicators and indexes and gender economics, uh, all those things are, are really important. Okay, now we have some questions. Uh, just to check the chat. Uh, uh, we have several questions just to check some of them uh, what if the father uses the parental leave because the mother isn't able to would he be paid more than if his mother used to this is a uh, this is related to economics, but it's more a legal issue, I have to say, because it depends on legal qualification. I'm experienced in that. So, for example, my wife, uh, she's entrepreneur because she's a lawyer, attorney at law, and they are qualified as entrepreneurs in Serbia. So uh, it depends So uh, on, on occupation and qualification. So if the father is not entrepreneur, uh, he would receive full salary. And if he is also entrepreneur, uh, he wouldn't receive full salary. So it depends on, on legal qualification. But once again, that's, that's the problem that we have to deal with. And uh, uh, I, in my opinion, we should amend labor law in this aspect and, and protect especially women entrepreneurs because they are extremely important and that's that's a good uh, intro <laughs> uh, to our next le uh, lecture because we will talk about uh, women entrepreneurship because uh, it's extremely uh, difficult to maintain your economic activities and, and to, to basically uh, to deal with, with entrepreneurship if you have to use maternity leave and not receive a significant 
uh, compensation, let's say, during that period, it's really hard to maintain your business if you are entrepreneur. So that's that's a huge problem currently in Serbia because women have to uh, take and use maternity leave, and if they are entrepreneurs, that's that's a really significant loss uh, for them, and also, as I explained, for for a whole society. So it depends on, on parents and their occupation. That would be answer, final answer to your question. Uh, okay, yeah, I think we, we are on the same, same page now and we answered all the questions. Do we have some questions here? Adjusted and unadjusted gender pay gap, right? Okay, once again. Uh, gender pay gap. Termine, jasne. Justified or just. Okay, okay. The terms, the terms. Yes. Okay, I thought that that was clear, but once again, yeah. Adjusted pay gap is a pay gap when you take into account all those different elements level of education, uh, uh, human capital, experience, productivity, and so on. So you adjust values of average salaries, and then we are talking about adjusted gender pay gap. It would be more precise to use adjusted gender pay gap or to take into account all those different aspects, but unfortunately, usually it's impossible. So we are talking about unjusted. So it's not corrected for all those elements. We just take average salary of men and women and compare those two values and observe uh, average. Yeah, average, average salary and the difference is gender pay gap. So that's the difference between those terms. Uh, once again, it would be better to use adjusted or to consider all those different elements when analyzing gender pay gap. That would be more, we, we would get more accurate picture, clear picture, but it's not possible. So usually we are using uh, uh, an adjusted gender pay gap or we just consider take into account average salary of men and women and see what's the different and that's that's the gender pay gap but still that's that's also a significant indicator of gender inequality uh, because i mentioned some of the studies uh, they they calculated adjusted gender pay gap and still it's it's still significant it's uh According to some studies, it's far to, uh, four to five percent lower than unjusted gender pay gap, but still it's nine to ten percent different b difference between uh, average salary of men and women basically doing the same job with the same qualifications, and basically that's an indication that we do not have gender equality, or in other words, that we have discrimination against women, whether in 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 terms of maternity leave or in terms of um, I don't know labor contract cancellation terms or uh, pregnancy leave or wherever, but all those uh, things basically create a basis for discrimination and that reflects differences between average salaries of men and women. So that that's, I would say, uh, that, that's the explanation behind the gender pay gap and that's the thing that we should deal with uh, in, in, the, in the next period, definitely, in Serbia. Okay, so do we have... Okay. Okay, now we'll we'll take a break, like fifteen minutes break. Now it's okay. Okay. Till seven forty five. Uh we'll take a fifteen minutes break and then we may continue with the third lecture and within the third lecture we're gonna deal with even more specific issues like gender and innovation, gender entrepreneurship, and then we may raise uh, once again some of those questions and answer some of those questions related to, to women entrepreneurship. Okay, so we are on time and we are making 15 minutes break. Thank you once again.